Are you prepared? You don't think it's going to happen to you. You hear about it happening a million miles away to somebody else in another state. You don't know the situation. You never think it's going to happen to your kids or even anybody you know. New tonight at 5.30, a warning that all of us parents really need to hear. This after an eight-year-old soccer player died on the field, eight years old. He told his dad he didn't feel right, and minutes later, he died. NBC Charlotte's Rachel Lundberg is live tonight. Rachel, you spoke to a pediatric cardiologist today. What did the doctor have to say? This is really scary when parents hear something like this. Exactly, Bill. Bottom line, it's scary for anyone, especially parents who might have kids at practice right now or out here at the park playing. But the doctor said that tomorrow they're definitely going to be hearing a lot of the phones ringing, parents trying to schedule their children a doctor's appointment after this story. He told me, like, Daddy, I can't see. Daddy, I can't see. And it's, it's fell. And um, started, what? started doing more. I've all seen a little bit. Minutes before, eight-year-old Caleb Ray was kicking a soccer ball. Today I have video of him uh, uh, practicing his goalie uh, probably 10 minutes before his heart stopped, and he's jumping up and down. NBC Charlotte has covered several fatal events like this. Aaron Barker, the basketball player at Olympic High School. He said practice was good, hour and a half, not even. Later, Taryn was coming in my room saying Aaron was unresponsive. Another incident at Providence Day, 16-year-old Billy Cohen collapsed on the soccer field. CPR saved his life, but it didn't save Caleb's, and there wasn't a defibrillator on the field. But when it happens and you hear about an event in West Virginia, and you're sitting here in Charlotte, it makes you wonder, huh, what about my children? David Olmstead, pediatric cardiologist with Novant Health, says these heart defect fatal events happen to about one in every 200,000 kids out playing. What are some symptoms that parents can definitely be on alert for for their children? Changes in tolerance to exercise. So if six months prior you could run sprints at X amount of time, and now you feel now it's a little, it takes a little longer, it's a little more difficult, or you're getting winded more easily, those are important, sometimes subtle symptoms. Better to be over cautious. Also, I reached out to CMS. They got back to me and said that they have an AED, which is an automated external defibrillator on every school's campus, but it's crucial to know where they're at, how to use them, and when to use them. Reporting live at Freedom Park, I'm Rachel Lundberg for NBC Charlotte. You know, Rachel, that is a scary story to hear. It's very sad, but it is one all of us parents need to hear. Thank you. I hope that grabs your attention. Hi, my name is Dr. Steve Horowitz. Very briefly, my background, I had the good fortune of being a doc on the United States Olympic team medical staff in 1996. Yes, that is me with hair. And more recently, I completed one of the first docs in the state of Texas and in the US to complete the FIFA diploma in football medicine course. Do you feel lucky? American Heart Association survey of 3,000 workers. The majority of workers could not locate the AED. The data suggests these untrained employees may be relying on their untrained peers in the event of an emergency, leaving employees with a false sense of security that someone in the workplace will be qualified and able to respond when that is clearly not the case. Liability. You can't change the liability by not adopting standards. It's there whether they want it or not. If I'm looking at the case and they don't have any procedures or protocols, it's going to make them look worse. They're going to be bound by what's out there anyway for why they didn't take the time to show they cared and they wanted safety procedures and policies. Sports legal expert attorney, Steve Shapiro. So why risk management? to avoid harm in the first instance, to assure the survival of the association when harm occurs, to provide consistent, effective approach to addressing risk, and because it's the right thing to do for our players. Ask the following questions. What could go wrong? What can be done to prevent it from happening? If it does go wrong, how do you respond? How do we ensure the effectiveness of the program and keep it current? 
Who is responsible? Who is trained? Are coaches responsible for their athlete safety? Coaches and parents share the responsibility for the player's health while at practices, scrimmages, and games. Coaches or team managers should have the player's medical release forms and a medical kit with them at all times. Coaches should have an emergency plan in place so if someone is hurt in a practice or a game, the coach knows who to call, where emergency personnel might take the injured party, and how to contact family members. Is the organization responsible for athlete safety? In loco parentis, or in place of the parent, charged with a parent's right, responsibilities, and duties. Are coaches and referees trained on what to look for to make judgment calls? Let's start with emergency action plans. A lawsuit was filed by the family of a 16-year-old basketball player. After the player fell to the floor, an emergency room physician and a nurse who separately were in attendance to watch the game came out of the crowd to render assistance. They immediately began performing CPR and requested an automated external defibrillator, AED, but one was not available on site. The suit asserts the school failed to develop and implement an emergency medical response plan for athletic events and that by failing to have an AED available, the school also failed to fulfill its duty to provide a safe playing environment and to provide adequate immediate medical assistance. Emergency action plans. The first action of preparedness is to make a plan. Yet, only 16% of responding high schools reported having emergency action plans and rehearsing them annually. After this presentation, this will not be your team or your organization. Emergency action plans. The good news is that the Team Safe app walks you through the creation of an emergency action plan that is customized for your team. You may already have already created your team's EAP by answering these questions. So what do we need to answer? Who's responsible for providing on the field care? In other words, who will care for the athlete in the event of an injury? Think about this decision carefully. If you're squeamish around blood or a severe fracture, that's okay. Assign someone else to this responsibility. Who manages the rest of the team? Take a knee in the event of an injury to an athlete. Keeping everyone calm is critical so the injured athlete can be properly cared for. Kids may get scared, especially if the injury looks serious, so having someone take charge is important. Who manages the spectators? An injured athlete situation is stressful enough without the addition of people running up and potentially distracting you or preventing proper care. Management of the spectators is a critical job. Who calls 911? What do you say? The 911.gov website recommends calling 911 if you feel there's an, a, med a medical emergency. Here is the key point. If you're not sure whether the situation is a true emergency, officials recommend calling 911 and letting the call taker determine whether you need emergency help. How to make a 911 call. Dial 911. Say we have an injured athlete in need of emergency medical treatment. If the athlete is unresponsive, tell that to the dispatcher. The athlete is unresponsive. Give the address of the facility and the best entry point. Tell them you have somebody waiting to meet the ambulance. This is why spending five minutes to create your team's emergency action plan is just so important. Describe the injury and any treatment given so, so far. The dispatcher will ask you questions. Simply answer them to the best of your ability. The call taker's questions are important to get the right kind of help to you quickly. Be prepared to follow any instructions the call taker gives you. Do not hang up until the call taker instructs you to. Stay with the athlete and provide the appropriate emergency care until the ambulance arrives. Where's field 17? That question, who meets the ambulance? Making sure to assign somebody that ahead of time is so important because it may be easy for the ambulance, the paramedics to find the field or facility, but knowing where that field is, knowing where the best entry point is, they may not know that. And those are the critical minutes that can be lost, which may change the outcome. Plan ahead by assigning this duty to a coach or a parent, and that can dramatically speed up the care for the injured athlete. Who travels with the injured athlete? If the injured athlete 
does need to be taken in an ambulance, it can be quite traumatic. Assigning somebody to travel with the athlete, especially if they are very young, is just the right thing to do. Who gets the AED? Does your team, league, school, facility have an AED? If yes, where is it? Do you know how to use it? Have you taken a CPR course? Who has maintains the first aid kit? Does your team have a first aid kit? If yes, where is it? Do you know what's in it and how to use each item? Who notifies the emergency contacts in case of injury? Do you have all the emergency contacts for each athlete on your person? Please don't say you have a three ring binder. It's the 21st century and it can all be on your phone. Who documents the injury? In addition, if you practice and or play games at a specific facility, you must answer these questions and have this information immediately available. What is the facility name and the address? What is a good landmark or cross street? What is the nearest hospital? Do you have a hazardous weather location? You can see that just with five minutes of planning, you can outline a great emergency action plan and be prepared in the event of an emergency. There's nothing worse than mayhem at an emergency. I've seen it too many times. Concussion rates in soccer. Concussions now account for a higher proportion of injuries in girls soccer than boys football. Let me read that again. Concussions now account for a higher proportion of injuries in girls soccer than boys football. Concussions in soccer. In August of 2014, a 14 year old female soccer player suffered a concussion when, while attempting to strike a header, the girl's face collided with the head of another player. The lawsuit asserts that she was removed from the game for a few minutes and despite exhibiting multiple indicia of a concussion, she was allowed to return to action where she suffered another head-to-head -head hit resulting in a second impact syndrome traumatic brain injury. What is a concussion? The issue of concussions is clouded not only by the lack of data, but also by confusion in definition and terminology. The term concussion, while useful, is imprecise, and because disparate author groups define the term differently, comparison between scientific studies is problematic. Sports-related concussion is considered to be among the most complex injuries in sports medicine to diagnose, assess, and manage. The Berlin Consensus Statement of 2016 defined concussion as follows. It is a brain injury. It is caused by a direct blow to the head or other part of the body. Symptoms can occur quickly or be significantly delayed, may be short-lived or last a while. You don't have to be knocked out to have a concussion and you probably won't see the damage either physically or via an MRI. What does a concussion look like? Ding, bell ringer, head injury, blow to the head, brain injury, hard collision, he got popped or smoked, impact, impact event, and many more terms. All of these mean a concussion has occurred. The athlete must be removed from play and properly examined. No return on the same day. So how are you going to manage all this? Well, this can all be managed on your phone. There's an impact event, some type of collision. What did you notice? The signs of concussion. What did the athlete report? The symptoms of concussion. You need to document these. You need to communicate that the athlete was removed from play. You need to give parents the what to do because most people don't know what to do next. And you as the league coordinators, well, you need to track the progress so that athlete is not returned to play too soon. And you need a system where all this occurs real time. So did you notice a hard collision, loss of consciousness, where they slow to get up? Was their balance poor? Did they have an unsteady walk? Did they fall to the ground or back to the ground? Were they holding their head? Did they appear dazed or confused? Did they have that blank or vacant look? Did they have a facial cut or bruise? Did they experience a seizure? Was there a change in behavior that was immediately noticeable? Did the athlete vomit? Was the athlete very irritable? 
Did you notice that the athlete had an inability to stop crying? Did the athlete answer questions slowly? Those are the signs, what you notice. Tap, 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 it's recorded. Next, is the athlete complaining of? Headache, pressure in the head, any type of head symptom. Neck pain, do they feel like they're gonna vomit? Are they, do they have nausea? Are they dizzy? Is their vision blurry, their vision double? Any difficulty with vision? Slurred speech, radiating pain in the arms or legs, numbness or tingling in the arms or legs, sensitivity to light, sensitivity to noise. They say, I don't feel right. I can't think clearly. I feel sluggish, groggy. I feel very tired. I feel nervous. I feel sad. Do they report memory loss? <laughs> You are the coach when this occurs. Your roster screen is open in the Team Safe app. You click on the player. You tap Remove from Play. Did you notice? Tap on all the triggers that you notice. You don't have to memorize them. Click Next. Tap on all the triggers the athlete is complaining of. Tap Remove from Play. An immediate text is generated and sent to all stakeholders, parents, coaches, and administrators. Tap on the link in the text and you will see your athlete was removed for a possible concussion. Now what? This screen will give you instructions regarding emergency signs and symptoms, the Brain Injury Association 800 hotline, the concussion symptom evaluation form, the doctor's note you can bring to your child's doctor, and the return to play and return to learn protocols. The roster listing for the player is now highlighted with the words remove from play. Tap there and you can view the concussion report. This report records what happened on the field of play when it happened, the date, the time by whom the athlete was removed, and all the triggers. The parent then brings the child to the doctor, taps return to play, enters the doctor's name, the date on the doctor's note, Take an image of the doctor's note with our customized note and checks the consent box. I give consent for my athlete to return on the date indicated. Tap return to play. A text is now generated again to all stakeholders with the date on the doctor's note. The roster has been updated to doctor's note with the return to play date. The admin enters the web portal and using the filter system sees where each athlete is in the concussion protocol. Remove from play, has doctor's note, pending admin clearance, and cleared. Once the athlete is pending admin clearance, the administrator taps on the athlete, views an image of the athlete, the date on the doctor's note, and can verify the validity of the note, and then click clear player. A text is immediately generated, clearing the athlete to return to play. The roster is updated, noting the clear date, and the highlight will remain until that date. As you can see, you need a complete system, a system that educates, a system that documents, a system that communicates in real time to all stakeholders, and a system that provides oversight to administrators. The Robert Back case, football and quadriplegia. There were multiple points of failure through this whole case but there were so many opportunities to do this right. If anything, Robert is the victim of the decisions made by adults surrounding him. Eight-year-old boy dies after team's first soccer practice. Are you really sure you know what to do? Really sure? In a different incident, boy whose heart stopped during baseball game meets the paramedic who saved him. Everyone was out there pouring water on him. If Ramirez, the paramedic, who wasn't paid for by the organization, he just happened to be there, didn't get to a defibrillator on time, the boy would have died. Examining the Zeke Upshaw wrongful death lawsuit against the NBA. The Golden Five Minutes. Remarkably, for much longer than four full minutes, no CPR was initiated, no chest compressions were started, no oxygen mask was placed on his nose and mouth, no airway was cleared and secures, 
You know, defibrillator or patches were attached and secured to Zeke's chest. The lawsuit argues that defendants failed Upshaw by not initiating life-saving efforts, including defibrillation and CPR immediately after his collapse. Videos of the incident show him lying face down on the court for at least three full minutes as staff tending to him worked to determine what to do. Paramedics eventually placed him on a stretcher and removed him from the facility. So, are all your coaches trained in CPR? Do all your facilities have AEDs? Answer that question, please. Next topic, the heat. Lawsuit. South Carolina teens death related to football teams practice punishment in the summer heat. Lewis Simpkins died after being rushed to the hospital during football practice. This is an action to hold the defendants accountable for the wrongful death of Lewis Simpkins, age 14, who died after suffering a fatal heat-related injury during outdoor football practice administered and negligently mismanaged by defendants in 95-degree heat index temperature conditions. Good luck finding a day in the state of Texas when it's not at least 95-degree heat index. University of Maryland and the death of Jordan McNair. The football world awaits more details on how and why the 19-year-old Maryland offensive lineman died. The day he suffered heat stroke, 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 70% humidity, limited cloud cover. And it happened to two ISU football players. They suffered heat illness. They were rushed to the hospital. All conditioning practices. What's the rule for the heat? Cool first, transport second. Let's repeat that. Cool first, transport second. The most important factor in the treatment of exertional heat stroke is the timeliness of rapid cooling, preferably performed on site by whatever means available. So timely and on site, extremely important. If you don't have an ice bath, use ice packs, neck, armpits, groin. So what does your heat injury prevention and emergency plan look like? Know your athlete's medical history. Do they have sickle cell trait? We'll talk about that. Do they have prior heat issues? Parents, you must report this. Acclimate to heat over a minimum of eight to 14 days. Now let's think about this with kids playing video games, potentially all summer. Are they gonna come to practice ready? Probably not gradually increase intensity and length of practice. Wet bulb globe thermometer, do you know what one is? Or the heat index, pick one and follow the guidelines. We'll review that. Provide a shaded area, a tarp or easy up tent. Provide a kiddie pool, make it an ice bath or at least buckets where you can cool your feet and hands. Have plenty of ice spray bottles and cooling towels. Are the athletes being weighed twice every day before and after practices and games? This is a responsibility the parents can undertake because a greater than a 3% weight loss as compared to the prior day, possibly no participation. It will most certainly affect performance and can be medically dangerous. We want to replace every pound loss with approximately 16 ounces, some studies say 24 ounces of fluid. Sip, not gulp. You must sip it. You can't gulp 16 ounces and say you've replaced the pound that was lost. You also need to drink to thirst. The athletes may want to replace sodium. If you lick your skin, yes, lick your skin, it's super salty. Well, then you may be a salty sweater. If you have the white stains in the armpits and on the brim of the baseball cap, you might be a salty sweater and then sodium can be very, very helpful. Water and rest breaks every 15 to 30 minutes. Obviously, the hotter it is, the more frequent the water and rest breaks need to be. You need to pay attention to your athlete's behavior. That's not just coaches, but athletes have a buddy system. And athletes must be observant of urine color. We'll go over that right now. Am I hydrated? Here's the urine color chart. If you're above the red line, number three, you may be a bit dehydrated when it starts to get a bit yellow but certainly under the red line, then you're dehydrated and you're at higher and higher risk of a heat problem. So what about wet bulb globe thermometers and the heat index? Well, most organizations do not have wet bulb globe thermometers. They're typically only in high schools and very few high schools have those. So let's use the heat index because the heat index is available for free. You can download the OSHA app, uh, 
tells the heat index by your location and get a number. And you'll see the numbers here. If you're under 95, so the numbers on the left are sports guidelines from the state of Tennessee, their high school sports associations. The numbers in the parentheses come from OSHA's guideline for outdoor workers. So which guidelines are right? Well, there's no real consensus, but this gives you a general rule for determining which guidelines you wanna use and what guidelines you want to provide. And these need to be mandatory. So you need to pick a plan and make the plan and have everybody pay attention to the plan. So as you get hotter, the water breaks get more frequent, the ice down towels are used regularly, and when it gets really hot, you're gonna to have to limit the time you practice outside, and really, really hot, you may wanna consider stopping all practice. That said, in the South, in the United States, it gets hot in the summer. So really making sure those athletes are acclimated to the heat becomes even more important. What can you do? Well, you can get the canopy, you can get a kiddie pool for a little more than $7 at the grocery store. If you want a really nice um, cold pool, ice bath, you can spend $35 at a Target, and get a nice cooler, get some ice towels. Parents need to participate in it. Everybody needs to participate in a proper heat plan. What about this thing called sickle cell trait? Well, sickle cell trait should be confirmed in all pre-participation examinations. Every child is tested for this. Once again, every child at birth is tested for this. So parents, you must know whether or not your child has sickle cell trait. It is not common, but between 2004 and 2008, there were five deaths, all African-American athletes in the NCAA. Sickle cell trait positive athletes are at risk during extreme physical exertion in the heat, high altitude, if they have asthma and infection or illness, if they have, are dehydrated, and if they are not properly conditioned. So you have more risk for a heat injury, gradual deterioration over several minutes, as opposed to a sudden collapse with sickle cell trait. You can get cramping, fatigue, exhaustion, muscle weakness, muscle pain, rapid de breathing, difficulty breathing, increased body temperature, all the things you see in heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Um, this boy, Carson Cross, age 14, first day of high school football practice, he died. Yes, he is white, and yes, he had sickle cell trait, and yes, it was never reported. Rhabdomyolysis. You may have heard the term rhabdo in association with a certain exercise program. Rhabdomyolysis is a condition in which skeletal muscle breaks down rapidly. Rhabdo refers to the rod shape of the skeletal muscle cell. Myo refers to muscle. Lysis means breaking down. That means if these kids train way too hard, way too quickly, they are at risk for this problem. It can kill you. Give yourself a shot. That was anaphylaxis. Pretty scary, isn't it? It's an extreme allergic reaction to something like bee stings or here in Texas, fire ants or some type of food, peanuts, for instance, medication. So what do you need? You need an EpiPen or an epinephrine injector. EpiPen happens to be one brand. You can see the how to use. Well, we may want to think about this. Do you know which of your athletes has the risk of anaphylaxis, needs an EpiPen? Parents, have you talked to the coaches about this? Can you be at every game and every practice? Because you know those fire ants, they don't do a very good job of discriminating between games and practices. And we have just a little problem with them in the state of Texas. So 
an EpiPen plan. Who has the EpiPen? Who knows how to use the EpiPen? We get it. You're a parent, husband and wife, or single parent. Maybe you can't be at every practice. So once again, bad things happen at practice. So you may want to talk to the coach and have an EpiPen for the coach. You should actually have two EpiPens for the coach. Go over how to use it. And league, do you know every child who needs an EpiPen? And do you have the consent from the parent to administer the EpiPen so your coach can administer the EpiPen? And parent, think about this because if you deny that consent, then you must have you or representative of yours for your child be present at every practice, at every event that organization provides. There must be somebody there with that EpiPen. So think about this very carefully. We have a blue safety release and an orange cap, and that's what gets placed into the thigh, and you hold it there for three full seconds. Go over how to use the EpiPen. Well, anyone with severe asthma knows how crucial having an inhaler close by can be. And the tragic story of a 12-year-old boy in Ontario is testament to that. Ryan Gibbons had an asthma attack on the school playground, but his inhaler, according to school policy, was locked up in the principal's office. By the time his friends carried him there to get it, it was too late. Experts say it's imperative kids are able to use their inhaler immediately. Another scary video. Same questions, but now we just replace the EpiPen with an asthma inhaler. Do you notice the signs of respiratory distress, struggling to breathe, the nostrils flare, coughing, difficulty talking, wheezing, gasping, chest tightness, lips or fingernails, gray or blue, confusion, difficulty walking? Do you notice any of these? Call 911. Do you know how to use the inhaler? There are different shapes and sizes. And by the way, what is that emergency dose? How many puffs do you give? And how do you give a puff? How do you actually use an asthma inhaler? Let's watch. Breathe in, breathe out. If I can't breathe, asthma safety's all I'm worried about. Breathe in, breathe out. If I can't breathe, asthma safety's all I'm worried about. In case I lose my breath and have an asthma attack, always keep my aerosol rescue and handler on me strapped. In case I cannot breathe and I need some help, call 911 and follow these few steps. One, put the handler whole side down. Two, shake it well. Bow, bow, bow. Three, prime time. Spray once from you and me. Four, fingers needed from the face of the piece. Five, punch down once. Now breathe in deep. Then count up to ten. Six, let it all out. Now pause for a minute. Yeah, literally a minute. Space up again. Then once more with it. After you're done, rinse and spit. Big ups to him for having my back. With God in my hell of prayer, I'll get through an asthma attack. Now you do it. Video yourself singing with your inhaler and post it on Asthma Rangers Facebook to win prizes. Yes, another scary video. We don't have to make th these things up. They're occurring all the time. Did you see how the referee just stood there, whistle in mouth, hands on hips? He was frozen in inaction. That athlete had a seizure. What are you going to do? Call 911. Cushion and protect the head. Move harmful objects out of the way. Don't restrain the athlete. Do not open or put anything in the mouth and document how long did the seizure last. Thankfully, it's rarely more than five minutes, but that can be a very long time while you're there stabilizing the head, waiting for the ambulance to come. If the athlete becomes unresponsive, well, we must start CPR. After the convulsion stop, turn the athlete on his or her left side. 
remain with the athlete until the ambulance arrives. MRSA or methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Was there a lawsuit due to this? Well, of course there was. $12 million lawsuit for dirty wrestling mats. If you see skin lesions, disturbances in the structure of the skin that don't look right, mention this to the parent and don't let the athlete practice and make sure you know what's going on because this, this can spread like wildfire and can kill. Don't touch it. Remove the athlete from play. Contact the parent. Have your athletes clean their hands before and after playing sports. Don't share any items that come into contact with the skin like bars of soap and towels and return to play. Well, you must get a doctor's note. Bleeding injuries. One of my personal biggest pet peeves is not having proper gloves in a first aid kit. Most store-bought first aid kits have very cheap gloves. As soon as you put your hands in them, they break. So get a good set of gloves. You can go to any store and get a nice box of 100 uh, gloves for about $10 and make sure they fit your size hand. No sense if you're a small woman getting extra large gloves and no sense if you're six foot six guy getting small medium gloves. And you don't want to be surprised that the first aid kit has the small medium when you're a big guy. So if there's blood, what's the first rule of rescuing? Protect the rescuer. You must wear gloves. If blood is gushing or spurting from the wound, call 911. Put the gloves on. Do not remove any items stuck deep inside the wound. Apply pressure with a gauze pad. So you need gauze pads in that first aid kit to the wound. Use both hands and hard pressure if necessary. If bleeding seeps through the gauze pad, do not remove it. Simply add more on top. Once bleeding has been contained, do not move the athlete unless a hazard is present. Nosebleeds, they are frequently mishandled. Simple, squeeze the nostrils together for 5 to 30 minutes straight. Yes, 5 to 30 minutes straight without frequent peaking, meaning letting up on the pressure to see if the bleeding is controlled. Usually 5 to 10 minutes is sufficient. Keep the head elevated but not tilted way back because that position may cause bleeding into the throat and lugs. This maneuver works more than 90% of the time. I just broke it, Doc, but I didn't fracture it. Oh my, a broken bone is called a fracture. The break can be like a crack in a windshield. The broken ends pretty much line up or like snapping a pencil. The broken ends do not line up and the cracked bone may actually pierce the skin. Most common areas are the forearm, collarbone, and finger. Before EMS arrives, brace and hold. Brace and hold the body part in the position in which you found it. Do not try to realign the body part or remove clothing or shoes. If the bone is sticking out from the skin, do not try to push it back in. Cover it with a clean cloth. If there's swelling, gently apply ice over the clean cloth. Stop any bleeding by applying pressure as we just discussed. And of course, if the athlete becomes unresponsive, that trumps everything. You must start CPR. Liability and injury are very real. The people who govern sports can't really be assured that the people who are actually present and coaching, officiating or administering the particular event will know what to do unless they have developed policies and protocols and mechanics that people who are involved might actually utilize. People need to understand that pamphlets won't do it, laws are not a panacea, and if you have a law that all of a sudden magically everything will be okay somebody has to know when to have the child taken out and evaluated or the whole thing breaks down so what is the standard of care any organizations dealing with kids must protect the health, safety, and well-being of the kids. The more something you do, the better for you. Otherwise, you're going to get slammed. Dr. Ed Dragan, Youth Sports Liability Expert.
Competition coach taught us this to do? Oh shoot, I totally forgot. You know what? I'll go and do it as soon as I finish practice. Okay, I'll tell him we'll have it next week. You gotta hurry or we're gonna be late for practice. Guys, bring it in, we're gonna run some drills. Hey, Madison, 